All right, so we've got the Blackboard screen recording turned on. Uh, I can see that. So I have to say we have a lot of content tonight, um, and I probably won't get through all the slides, and I will try to not verbally rush too much. Uh, let's see, in the meantime. So the slides will be available on Blackboard if you want to look at the content that we did not get to. So don't get too anxious if it doesn't show up in lecture. Right. All right. So there was a so there's a lot of great feedback last week. So I really appreciate that. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time going over a few of the questions that people had. So I answered some of them via email after class last week, but I just wanted to hit a few of these in class. Um, one thing that I learned today that was maybe reinforced, I already knew, and I think I've said in this class, but was really reinforced for me today is like, um, as a data scientist, a lot of the code that I write will be seen by one person. Their feedback will say, that's not the analytic that I wanted. Here's what you should have done, right? And then I'll throw away a day's worth of code. So like, you know, eight to 10 hours worth of code, like continuously just writing code, the, the customer says, yes, but, or like, absolutely not. That's not what we wanted, right? Or like, occasionally, it's like a minor change for visualization. That's nice, because it saves most of the work you did. But sometimes, it's just straight up waste of time. So again, there's an emotional sort of feedback there. Of, it doesn't mean the work was wasted. It just means that you didn't get what the customer wanted, so you do more work. So uh, that was my feedback for today. <laughs> All right, so this is a, an observation that I arrived at I've seen a few people do this in homework I think um so and it's it's kind of subtle so um try and catch the error here that's going on in logic so as I've advocated when you attack the homework or any sort of challenging problem you should come up with a plan and say I'm going to do these steps in this order to resolve these dependencies um the problem is with the order of operations right so typically a student says I'm going to need a dictionary or a list or a string right or they, they, they have some concept of the thing they want and so they're going to name the variable like this is a dictionary or like this is a list right or, like something that describes the thing that they want and then they'll try and figure out like how to get that thing right so in some sense that that makes sense so you should figure out what you want and go get it um the problem is when the thing that you go get or the thing that you write the function typically if that doesn't return the thing that you were looking for and named, then you have a confusion. The confusion is that the thing that you've named doesn't actually contain the thing that you think it should. Right? Because you came up with the name and then supplied the content into that variable name. And if those two are mismatched, you're going to proceed as though the variable name reflects the content because that's your assumption. But then when you go through the rest of the program, you're like, there's an error and I don't know where this book is coming from, right? And it's coming from this mismatch due to the fact that you named a variable and then supplied content into it. So that's an issue. Um, so my plan, the reason I, um, I didn't even realize that I take this method until I came to this other approach. And so like, what I do is like, I'll, again, come up with a plan, figure out the, the steps that I want to do, and, and find that function or write it, right? like do a thing. Then I'll take the output of that function and I'll print it to screen. The value of that is I actually know what the function is returning. Then, this is where the order is different, then I say what variable name would be descriptive for the out, for describe the output function. That makes sense. So, so we've reversed the order here. First we look at the output of the function, then we name the variable to reflect that. It's a really subtle difference, but the consequence is there's an alignment between the name of the variable and the content of the variable. That's, that's <laughs> and then my mistake, I haven't been showing you this technique because I typically don't do live coding in front of you in class. So that'd be dangerous for me and probably a waste of your time. So um, I need to figure out like, so I, I have experimented with like recording my live sort of like coding process and making a video out of it. It's really boring. I mean, like, <laughs> like if you have this picture of like Ben talking to himself, narrating sort of like the actions I'm taking. So you get like an hour's worth of video for like a 20 line snippet of code. You're just like, well, that totally wasn't worth it. So <laughs> I don't know how to like better deliver that. That's the format that I've experimented with. But it's sort of like, I like to see insight on like how other data scientists live day to day. Most people aren't willing to like screencast and video record themselves as they're developing code, right? That's a very, I don't know, we say private practice, right? So. <laughs> 
But this is just a little observation that might help you reduce the number of bugs by aligning the content of your variable with the name of your variable by doing that order. Questions, comments? Have people like, is that, is that like a, is this is a projection I'm making upon you, or do you know that this is like something that you do? Do we have a head nod from Ken? Okay. <laughs> All right. So if I just wasted everybody's time, I totally apologize. But. All right, so this is a question that I was asked uh, uh, last week. The, the perennial question, I guess, this comes up over and over of like, I don't know what to do, what do I do? Right? Like, how do I find new uh, insight into the code that I need to write? And the way that I, and I've stated this before, like, if you've thought about whether or not anyone else has done this, that's like the first question. Has anyone else ever had this problem? If the answer is yes, and because we're talking about programmers, then you can go steal their code, right? Like, <laughs> be lazy. That's my, my refrain there, right? Um, and then obviously you can use the notebooks from this class, but I wanted to share like a couple of different websites that are like really uh, broad overviews of things that um, would be hard to find other like, places. So I'm gonna take a quick example here to the Python standard library. So like you're wondering, what things are built into Python? Well, there happens to be a really long web page with all that content. So I'm not gonna go over this in class, but like if you're just curious and you wanna get a like deeper understanding, this is a very concise way to say like, like for yourself, like a checklist, right? Like I know this, I know this, I know this, I've never heard of that. I should probably be familiar with it, right, if it's in Python. Someone made this wise decision to put this in the language. So it might be worth sort of at least familiarizing yourself so that next time you run into that issue, you know that that's built in. So that's one place to look. Again, there's just a ton of stuff. We have touched on a lot of it in class, sort of like randomly and sporadically, but this is a very systematic way of digging through all of the things available in Python. So uh, I, I don't recommend like sitting down and then reading that. Oops, let's see. I'm gonna go over a few more of these. Uh, this was another sort of like, so that, that was covering the core of Python. There's an, another website called Module of the Week. As you might guess, this covers a module that is wildly popular and widely used. Again, those are both votes that maybe you should be aware of it and familiar with how to use it. So um, this is a, a website of things to be aware of and sort of like you can see date time and random and like all the sort of base packages that you should be aware of in Python. They're all listed out here. Again, we've, we've touched a lot of these, maybe like 30%. So there's lots of things that we won't get to, but there's some good resources there. The other ones, I would just recommend PyPy. If you haven't been there, you probably have been there. You might not even know it, but uh, that website is a list of every package in Python uh, that the community is aware of, I guess. Oops. Let's get an actual URL in So you can see there's uh, browse projects. So there's, uh, you know, by topic, but then they wanted a, a long list. I guess there's like 100,000 packages, and so I'm not going to browse through all of them. But. Yeah, something like a, a million packages. Like, it's 125,000 projects. So again, I'm not expecting that you will be familiar with every single one of these, but it's another resource you can go to and usually has reasonable documentation or pointers to the documentation. All right, so that's there for your edification. All right, now we have an exercise. So you are gonna open up the Python notebook. If you don't have a computer, you can sit next to someone who has a computer. Not an in-class requirement, but I would suggest um, try these different commands. If you haven't used these before, just try them out. I'm going to give you a moment to, to do that on your own. I'm going to follow up with what I see just in case you don't have a laptop. So, so random is a library that everyone here has used. So this isn't something new, but this is a way of sort of like diagnosing like what's available from that library. All right, so I'm going to switch over to my notebook so I can see it myself. Not that one. Yeah, so I'm going to import the random library. And then when I run dir, this is showing all of the functions available in that module. So that's like a long list. The ones without underscores are the ones you typically use. Help 
So let's see what that looks like. So help on a module to return some documentation that's built into that code. All right, so again, if you're wondering like, what's the description of how to use these functions, this is where I would look. And that's pretty long. There's another one down here. Random question mark. All right, so this is, again, roughly the similar documentation, a little bit different presentation. Uh, and that's always available. And so you might ask, where do these come from? Well, so let's say I have a function and I use doc strings. So doc strings are special. They are three double quotes to start a doc string and then three double quotes to end a doc string. And they're within this function. So I've just defined that. So now I can type help my func. And so it prints the contents of the doc string from the function. So that's that's where the magic is hidden, right? Someone before you wrote a bunch of code and then documented it. And then if you want to see what that looks like for the function that I wrote, you can say like it the question mark just returns the doc string and like where the file is also. So there's no magic, it's just uh, things you can create yourself. Questions on that? So Oh yeah, and tab completion. Almost forgot about that. Right. So the other one that I wanted to demonstrate while we're sitting here in a notebook, and this is something that I want you to do while I'm doing it. So import pandas and then type pandas dot in a new cell. So I'm gonna come down here, type import pandas. Right, and we'll put that in a new cell and then we'll say pandas. And what I want you to do is type period tab. Does that get you a pop-up menu? And if you say no, then we should talk after class because there's probably some packages you're missing. So this is another quick way of like, I have a module, what about, what's available from it? All right. And then, so this is like, hmm, go ahead, tab. tab. So like pandas, spell the name of the module, dot, and then hit tab, and it should auto-complete the functions that are available from that module. Okay. So then I'm going to do a little bit, uh, one more, one more magic. I'm going to type one of the functions there. I'm going to type parentheses and then tab. So this is all of the arguments that that function can take. Not all of them are required, but it's just showing you like, if I'm going to create a pandas data frame, these are the arguments that that function can take. And if you don't have this, I'm, I'm hoping that you're doing it live so that we can figure out and diagnose whether this capability is missing. It looks like everybody's happy. Okay. But you did get the first one? I didn't get the first one. All right. Follow up after class with me, and we will diagnose that. Okay. I think that's all I have on that one. All right. So, and this is a slide that I presented before, but sometimes I'll show you like really complicated sort of sets of arguments to uh, like pandas. I didn't just like memorize or have those innately embedded in my head. I have a poor memory. So what I do is like I try the first thing and that fails and then I have to add in another sort of magic incantation and that, and I, that fails. Right? And so like it's this iterative process that again is obfuscated because I'm not doing this live in front of you. Yeah, and so at the end of class, I'm gonna assign some homework with a little twist for me to measure this effect. So I'll hold you in suspense, it's a little foreshadowing, but it's related back to this. All right, and then one last uh, little comment from a uh, question, I guess you would say. All right, so yeah, the following long part is over. You're certainly welcome to try this if you want, um, but that's not the expectation. So this is all about errors. So when an error happens in Python, you get an error message back. And there's some special sort of like format to that, which is helpful to understand in order for you to debug what's actually happening. So I'm gonna start a new notebook, and then I introduce a variable which I haven't used before, and if I call that, it's gonna complain, right? Python's saying like, you haven't defined this, I don't know what to do. And so this is um, a few features to recognize here. This is the line count, so we're on line two, in that cell. Right? And so they got this giant arrow pointing to where that is happening. 
And then they even tell you this is called a traceback. So the specific error that they encountered is a name error. And then if they're nice, they give you a little complaint about what they think the problem is. So this is Python trying to debug for you what the problem may be and telling you where to look. All right, let me clear these outputs and then we'll clear all outputs. Yeah. All right. All right, so I get an error. That's cool. All right, typically, someone will write some code and they'll have a syntax error. So it's just like not providing Python what it expects to, to see. And so when you have the def keyword, they expect something in that line to have like a, a colon. So this is a syntax error. They're pretty easy to fix. So I typically don't see those in your notebooks. All right, so if I add in that semicolon, that goes away. So easy to fix. All right, and then, so here's where the problem occurs. So not all syntax errors are reported correctly. All right, so let's say I define my function, and there's a couple issues going on here, right? So if I have a function, it's missing a semicolon, it's got the wrong number of indents, and it's telling me that the, the return statement is incorrect. And you're just like, well, that doesn't make any sense, right? <laughs> and the problem here is that Python is like, trying to figure out where the error is, but it's making a mistake. And this makes your job harder because you're like, the return statement is clearly correct. Right? It's got four spaces, what's going on here, right? So if we correct this one, we still have that return problem. So it didn't actually report all the errors. And we correct that, now we're back to having a working function. So we can get, we can correct the errors, but um, they're not necessarily reported correctly. So. The, the, trip, the trick that I have for you is if you see an error and that line looks correct, it's probably on the line above. So just like follow the, the stack up to see where you think the error might actually be. All right, this is a, a super common, it's so common that I thought it was worth including in this lecture. There's a thing called buffer overflow. Like if you try and access elements of a list and you go past the size of the list, you're pointing at the things that don't exist. So Python is very diligent and tries to protect you from your own mistakes, right? I've got three elements, so if I try to get to list five, it's saying there's an index error. So Python is saving you from yourself and it says, don't go over there, there's nothing there to be found. The normal situation is that if you try this, it'll stop the entire notebook, right? And that, that is usually the desired response, but sometimes you want to let the notebook proceed. So this is where try accept statements come in. So if I wanted to, to try that thing, but then like if it fails, like send the alert message, but keep going. That's what this little snippet does here. So I try something and then because I have an expectation of what type of error will happen, I can catch that here with an accept statement for that type of error and then tell the user what happened, right, or what condition to, to follow up. But you'll notice there wasn't any big orange box following this cell, so this notebook will continue to execute if that were the only issue. So, all right. And then I think this is towards the, the, the last little observation is that the confusing part was stacked. So like all of these errors that we've seen so far, they're a single error, and they're very easy to diagnose because they're small snippets of code. But typically, people write pretty complicated snippets of code. And so it helps to actually understand what the uh, traceback is telling you. All right, so I've got two functions. You can already sort of guess I'm going to cause myself to have an out of bounds index error, right? Because I'm returning my list five. So it'd be pretty easy to pass in a list that doesn't have five elements access. So that's all. Uh, I'm just building on what I've previously shown you. But here I'm calling that function from this one. So this is where the, the traceback looks a little different. All right, as I warned you, I'm gonna pass in uh, a list that only has three elements. And so when I go to call that function and it tries to access the fifth element, that's where the error occurs. And so this is where reading this is a little bit more complicated. So now there's three arrows. I would three different sets of line numbers. What's going on? So this is where we first started out, right? Top of the error message is the line from which we initiated the error. And then as we follow down, 
that cell called this function was looking at where that function um, was used and then saying like, but this one called another function, right? So we have basically a nested sort of set of functions here. So just to review this line here in that cell called this function speaker. And then from the speaker function, we called the a func and passed it a list. And that's where we had the error. So the reason that we have this more convoluted um, report is because the Python is trying to trace where all the function calls were. So again, this is where you triggered the error, but this is the thing that actually had the error. And so that traceback stack is something that you would have to follow back in your code to figure out like where the error is and how to fix it. Okay. Questions on that? And and so the most of the time you'll see this in someone else's code where like you're using a Python package and you're causing an error in that package. So it'll be like 20 sort of like function calls that are nested. And that's where it gets really messy because then it gets hard to follow like what is the error that I'm actually causing and how do I fix that? So it's typically more complicated from this. All right. Mm. I think, yeah, so then if you know this sort of thing is going to happen, you can just use that same try except pattern and then it will complain, but it will actually execute. So that's what you can do to handle that error. All right, and usually I'll just leave this here. Most of the time, um, a lot of the problems that I see are because the types are mismatched. So like someone's trying to do something they shouldn't, like um, look at a string and think of it as a list, which you can, but as long as the string is sized appropriately to the list element that you're calling, so it gets a little messy, but we'll leave that there and speed along. So you can basically check that it's considered bad practice in Python. Mm -hmm. To do it in your program. Right. Questions on errors. Have people seen errors before? Yes, good. Okay. <laughs> Making sure you're in the right class. All right. So that was the questions from last week. All right. So we're coming up towards the end of the class. So you've got the project two coming up next week. If you have questions on that, I can take those now after class, an email, and a meeting in person off out of class time. So like however you want to work that. And I will be sending more information about how we're going to run the class uh, next Wednesday. Questions now? Everybody's super excited. Until. All right. All right. Oops. We're gonna... All right. So we're going to talk about clustering, but we're going to do a little bit of uh, deviation. Um, this is a, a trick that I wanted to pass on to you. No one asked about it, but I'm going to pass it on to you anyways. So one last little demo here. So we have uh, a, a Python notebook that has a function called through a CSV to load it. It's a bunch of baseball data. The actual fact that it's baseball doesn't matter. That's not the exercise here. What I've shown you before and what you may use in your projects is this idea of like trying to figure out the top unique entries for a column in a data frame. Like this is a, to me a, a regularly used snippet of code the question becomes like, how do I maintain that in my own sort of like data scientist toolbox of functions that are commonly applied across lots of different data, right? Like this function I would claim is useful generically. So the question is how do you make that generically available function available in your notebooks, regardless of where you go? So that's what this is answering here today. All right, so I created, so before this class started, I created a function uh, in a Python file, so my functions.py, and the contents of that file are just the function that I used up there. So this is just a little preview of the contents. Right? It's a plain text file.py, and the trick that we're going to use here is that in Python we can call functions from external files. So that the use there is I'm going to use run, and now the contents of that file are loaded in the notebook, right? So that's good because it means we can now use that function um, in the notebook, and so it returns exactly what we wanted it to. So success, right? The convenience here is I can take that one py file and carry it around with me, and any notebook that I need to have, I can just load in my predefined functions to execute against the contents of that notebook. So it's a 
useful little way of carrying around um, snippets of code that you want to reuse, rather than going back to old notebooks and like digging up like the code you want to use and like copy pasting it over. Right? You just have one file and you can load it in. There's a problem though. Right? You know, notice. So like, I ran this run my functions dot py, and the problem is, I don't act like unless I did this little cat command to see what the contents were, I don't actually know what the contents of that Python script are. Right? So I I happen to know that I would have to call that uh, function using this command, right? So like, how would how would what's the right way to do that, right? And the other question is, where does this code live? It still lives in the py file. It's not actually in the notebook. So now you've separated the functions you're running in Python from the data and the notebook that you have. So what would you really want right, is the ability to not only load that function in, but load the code in with the function. All right, let's let's use that keyword load. All right, so there's a there's a magic command in Python uh, in Jupyter called load. So when I run that against the .py file, it's the same .py file. Let's run it. Look what it did. It magically took that snippet of code, loaded it into Jupyter, and told you where it came from. Right now, a comment. Does anyone want to see that again? All right, so <laughs> let's do that again. It is pretty sneaky. So this is basically the statement, nothing up my sleeve. Like I'm, this cell contains just a command called load my functions. And when I press shift enter, it converts that thing, that magic command, into a comment, and then takes the content of the file and puts it in the cell. So now we've solved. And go ahead, John. That's Yes. So this is uh, it solves two problems. One is now we know what the contents of that file are, and when we go off and like, let's say we move that my functions UI or we update it, we change it, the code is still in the notebook. So that's good. We want to have all the data and the code and the visualizations in one place. So that's, this accomplishes that problem. It introduces another problem though, right? If I go back and like change my toolbox, right? So if I edit this function and correct it in the my functions.py, I've now disconnected the, the file from the notebook, right? Because this is, just going to run and it's associated with the notebook independent from the load, from the run from the uh, my functions up <clears throat> Does that make sense? So you've solved one problem and introduced another. So now you've got two separate files and they're no longer linked. So okay. yes. If you use the percent run, they are still linked. Oh, and yeah. So that that's a good thing in the sense of like if you want to go back and edit the py file, then when you rerun your notebook, it will look for that changes. But it means that you can't run the notebook without having that file. So I don't have a, like a magical solution. It's sort of a choice you get to make between do I want to bind the notebook together with this external py file and keep them synchronized, or do I want to have them independent, which is probably my better choice. But then like every time you make a change to your .py file, it's no longer updated in the notebook automatically. So that's a trade-off. And I'm not, so I'm not expecting that you will use that approach in this class for this material. But my suspicion is when you go off into the real world and try to solve problems for people, like you'll have a set of things that are commonly used by you and you're going to go off and attack a bunch of different problems. And so like having that common repository of functions can be useful. Okay. All right, so as I promised, we're actually going to talk about clustering, but let's take a break first. All right, so we'll come back at 8.03. Yes. Yes. Uh, And then I'll be back over here. So creating a module? Yes. You can create packages. Yes. Well, so you literally use the import statement and the name of the PY file. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 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 Yes.
myself and then I'll be tell Siri to Yeah this you can hear him distress about time.
doing a lot of that next week. <laughs> All right, we've got everybody back, I think. Well, I have one. All right, we'll get started. So the, <laughs> the last week we talked about linear regression. If you've been, if you are in 602, then you've already seen this before, and I apologize. It won't take very long because there's not a lot of stuff there, but basically we applied um, linear regression. We didn't get to apply it in week seven, but that's where you might also have seen it for correlation. And then we <coughs> did see it in uh, trend fitting. And the other place where linear regression shows up is in prediction. And there's two sort of senses of prediction. One is the extrapolation sense of I've got a data set and I want to see what the values would be for data that I haven't collected yet. So it's sort of like outside the bounds. The other sense of uh, prediction is usually thought of as uh, supervised machine learning. So this is where I have a bounded range of data and I want to predict a new value within that range. So those both count as prediction, but in different senses. So this just shows you the sort of strength of linear, prog linear regression across these different use cases. So that was over here, right, linear regression. And today we're going to talk about unsupervised machine learning, so clustering. This is a relatively simple technique. And oh, I forgot to draw a picture. I will draw a picture. All right, so we're going to talk about a couple different types of clustering, divisive, agglomerative. And then, uh, but in order to sort of motivate you, I wanted to show you that there are use cases that you can go and explore. So again, on your computer, open up a web browser, then type in yippee.com. Well, I draw. And then once you've got that website open, search for the word data science. I'll do the same in mine so you can see what happens. Has anybody got a result yet? What do you see on the left side? Well, so there's a bunch of, there's a column on the left side, right? Right, so, so the, that, that page has a bunch of, sort of topics that are clustered near the topic that we've searched for. Let's see if I can pull it up. So, so this is sort of useful in your thought process of like things that are related to data science it gives you that column. So that's an idea of clustering, of like, what's the adjacent topics? If you think about it, it's, it's sort of a weird measure, right? Like you've got this concept, and there are concepts that are nearby it. But nearby in what sense, right? Like, how is the word uh, Python close to data science? Like, if you think of from a physical perspective of distance, it gets a little confusing. But conceptually, like, it makes sense that those should be together, right? So this is sort of like the magic of data science. It's not even close. <laughs> but the only reason I'm showing it is because this is one of the search engines that does clustering of topics on the default homepage. So I'm definitely not advocating Yippee in your day-to-day -day use. But it is useful if like, you have a topic and you want to know what's related, right? Right. So the other place that uh, clustering usually gets used is if you've got like a huge database of like customers and you want to know like what are the different demographics, right? Am I, am I mostly targeting females in the 40 to 50 age range or is it males in the 10 to 20 age range, right? Like how do I get those different um, users, different information about the product I want to sell, right? 
specifically you want to target the thing you talk about to a product to the audience you're talking about in order to make a better sale. The way to do this is to figure out how should I think of my customer base, right? And what sort of groups do they naturally clump? And this market segmentation, that's the jargon word for it, um, it's pretty useful because now they know to target people in this demographic and this demographic, but not over here. So that's a typical use case for clustering if you want to sell things. All right, another use case is anomaly detection. So if I have sort of things that are good and other things that are good, and you have like this few use cases which are outliers from either of those clusters, then maybe I should spend more time investigating that thing which is an outlier. So figuring out where the clusters of goodness is is relatively easy usually because like almost all the network traffic that we see, right, is like good or nominal or like don't care about it. And so you want to figure out if I'm looking at network traffic, where do I find the anomalies? Right? Because it looks like other network traffic. And so figuring out this one is an outlier because it's not having the same behavior as the other ones. Clustering is another way that we do that. Right. So I'm not giving you enough details to actually implement this uh, use case, but uh, a thought pattern of how to, how to use it. All right, methods. So there's a couple of different methods. We're going to go over these in a little bit more detail um, in a moment. The, the two hierarchical algorithms that we'll talk about are agglomerative and divisive. So if you look at those words, agglomerative, like bringing things together, divisive, splitting things up. And so let's. Mm, yeah, let's do that. All right. So now we have an activity. So we're going to start. Everybody is spread out pretty evenly in the room. I'm going to claim this is where we're starting from. And what we're going to do is a glomer of clustering. Right? So the goal here is to take the people present in the class, you're the data points, and we're going to move you closer together physically, right? So you're going to form groups. And the clustering is going to be based on the length of your name, your first name specifically. So uh, you can, if you have multiple first names, you can choose your length. But so the goal here is to talk with other students and cluster, right? And so basically, you're running an algorithm in parallel, right? So everyone's acting independently, and they're interrogating their neighbor to figure out how long is your name, what's my name length, like? should we be in the same group, right? So we're going to run this algorithm in parallel just to so you could observe the noise. <laughs> Raising your hand, what does that do? <laughs> All right. How are we doing? So are we think we've settled already? You're your own group. Awesome. Okay. So how many people have two letters? None. All right. Three. We've got one, four, a cluster over there. Awesome. Five, two over there. Six, a cluster. Seven, eight, nine. Did I get you guys already? Five. Five. Okay. Four, five. All right. I think we're gonna do it. All right, so we got everybody, right? So what were your observations about like how many interrogations was that, right? Like every person talking to every other person? Not quite, right? And so it's a little less than that. So that's sort of a measure of the computational cost. How many people did you talk to, right? And it ran pretty quickly. So it's easy to parallelize, right? If you have a really big data set, super easy. Right? You just look at all the pairs. But you, even, you don't even have to usually do that because, like, once you've paired people up, that's a new group, and it reduces the throughput. Computationally efficient, easy to parallelize, it's easy. And if you're really smart, you can figure out what the next activity is later in the class. <laughs> All right. So now we'll talk about a, a different algorithm, partitional algorithms. So this is basically the idea that we're going to construct uh, various guesses and then evaluate those guesses to see how good they are. 
So for this exercise, I'm going to need someone who has not previously heard of k-means as an algorithm or has not been here before. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So we got his volunteer. Marker here, the marker of responsibility, is to take the data points that we have here, two numerical sets of data, I'm sorry, two arrays of numerical data, plot and dimensions. You can cluster those into three groups, draw a circle around the three groups. All right, so now the hard part. Can you explain how you did that? Um, okay. I mean, well, visually, it just makes sense that these are around the same Y. Okay. Same thing for these, especially these two. This one, these two are a little bit, well, this sense is a little bit different. Than the, like, not like, but obviously, these are like the same, exact same Y. And it's very close. They're exact same X. Right, right? Yeah, it's same X. So, so basically, I to restate that, I think you were taking basically the distance between these two in space and minimizing that with the three plus. Is that accurate? Yeah. Thank you. All right. So this is like <laughs> my favorite part of lectures, like taking someone who like doesn't know the algorithm, but they actually do know the algorithm. Like Zach just did that. That is the algorithm. All right. Basically, make a bunch of guesses, check the distance, and then minimize the error. That's it. It's super easy. All right, so good job. Thank you for that. All right, so the same algorithm, a little bit more formally, is, is stated in these steps here. And so I'm going to walk through these visually with a program. And, and so basically, there's different ways that you can minimize the distance between the, the clusters, but we'll go with residual sum of squares. All right. Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of code. We'll come back to this code in a moment. But basically, we're going to use uh, scikit-learn. If you haven't heard of that before, you'll use it in 602 probably. Um, we're just going to use that to generate a bunch of blobs of data points. And then we're going to plot the data using matplotlib. And then there's this handy-dandy function, the pairwise distance, which looks at all the different pairs and tries to do the, the distance measurement for all pairs. So this is, I'm sort of like, here I do have something in my sleeve. I'm setting there to be four groups in this code, and I'm going to make 300 data points in those four blobs. So I've already sort of solved the problem of how many clusters are there, but that's because I needed to generate the data from scratch. OK, this is basically just making the picture. So we'll run that. And then we're going to do a little animation frame by frame. We're going to draw the points as the algorithm is executing. So. Hopefully, yeah. Okay. So this first picture, I can make this a little bigger, is showing the the four blobs, and I'm gonna guess four different locations for the randomly placed centers of those blobs. So the inputs were the data that I have, the number of clusters, and then some random initial points of where those four guesses are gonna be located. All right. Then I'm gonna basically take the points that are nearest those initial guesses and separate those into groups. So this was my guess. And then I'm going to say, as I place that guess there, the nearest points uh, for those to that center is all of these. And it's I'm basically just partitioning off the space to be associated with these four groups. Now, you'll notice that that's wrong, right? Like, we can sort of, by inspection, view that that's probably a uh, it's going to end up being wrong, so we're going to have to do some corrective steps here. Once you, so once we've uh, figured out that these, all these points form our claim of a group, we're going to recenter our guess, and so we take the points and we figure out what is the center of all the points that I'm that I've colored blue, and it happens to be here. So I'm going to move my initial guess to this new location. So I'm going to update that location. And then I'm going to recolor. I'm going to regroup all the data points with their new cluster location. So now you can see, like, it's already gotten in two steps to a pretty good guess for what the uh, 
these groups are going to be. And so now we've recolored these data points to be associated with this guess. And we're going to iterate that algorithm a few more that those set of steps a few more times to get new guesses, and you're going to have smaller and smaller error distances between those. All right. So in the end, the error gets so small that we claim success, and so now back we've got the four groups. Right. This shouldn't be too surprising because we started with four groups. We made a guess. We're four groups, but the algorithm is sort of like intuitive to walk through. Exactly. The, the error there being uh, that distance, right, that I have to move the center. Okay, so I'm gonna, these are backup slides. Right, so there's a couple of gotchas. Right? The gotchas are you can end up with a wrong solution if you only use one run of this algorithm, right, because this is called a, a local minima. Like, there might be a case that, like, so the algorithm it found the, the solution that minimizes the error, but is wrong. And so the solution to this is run the algorithm a bunch of times with a bunch of different initial guesses. So it's a good thing that this algorithm is computationally inexpensive, because you typically need to initialize it with a bunch of different random guesses and run those over and over to figure out, are they always getting the same results? It is a consistency. How do you reassign? So that was, right, so we made some guesses, right, and then we said, whichever data points are closest to our initial guesses, we're going to call that a group. And then we're going to say, let's recenter that initial guess based on the coloring that we just did. So that's this step. And then after that, then we recalibrate the grouping based on the moved center. Yep. Is that answer? Right. So basically, you have to run this. Out. So let's say I have a set of data and I want to cluster it. I have to make a guess, and I run the algorithm a bunch of times for a bunch of different initial points. So it's like cost number one. Cost number two is how many uh, groups should I guess? Right. Should I guess that there k equals one, k equals two, k equals three? Right. What's the answer there? The answer is you look at like. How quickly does that rate of error change? Right? And, and the right number of clusters is the one where you have this change in the rate of errors. There's somewhat of an inflection point here. So we can sort of see for this data set, it's very quick for uh, five, uh, six, five, and four clusters. But then if I guess too few clusters, it takes a really long time to minimize that error. So there's an indicator that. Because there's this sort of like pink in our uh, rate of error for all these different guesses, that's uh, an indicator that four is the right number. Right. So now we've got a second cost. Not only do you have to run the algorithm for a bunch of different initial guesses for each value of k, we have to run a bunch of different k's to figure out what the right guess for the number of groupings there are. All right. Everybody's good. Oh, yeah. And I have that in a notebook. It's not super exciting because all it does is just make a picture. So, but the code code will be available, and you can just see that uh, there. All right. So, there's one more set of steps to take in this. Once you've identified the clusters, you typically want to identify why are they clusters, right? So, going back to our marketing example, we've taken you know 10,000 customers and we've segmented them into different groups. But now I have to identify what is the feature that makes this group a group, right? Is it uh, uh, white females in their 40s versus like Hispanics in their 20s or males, right? How do I get those labels with the groups? That's the challenge. And so there's a couple different approaches here. I'm not going to go over decision trees, but if you've heard of those in 602 or you'll take those in 602, that's one method to figure out what are the relevant attributes. That is to look at the the different attributes for each cluster and see which ones are um, most popular. But in general, labels are hard. Questions on that? All right. Well, 
Whoa, oh, it's 820. That's, that can't be right. My bad. All right. So we've only covered numeric data. And numeric data is relatively easy. But most data is not numeric. It's a bunch of text. So how do we do clustering for text? All right. So this is where the real work begins, right? So like numeric data, you just feed it into the k-means algorithm. Clustering is pretty straightforward. But we've got web pages, PDF, Word documents, all this other good stuff. And typically, like if someone wants to do analysis of one document, you just read it. And you tell them the topic of the document was this. Mm -hmm. right, but often, you'll say, oh, here's the past 1,000 reports. Could you tell me what the different topics in these reports are? And you're like, uh, no. <laughs> Right? You're not going to have time to read a 1,000 documents. And so that means you're going to have to use your data science skills to figure out what are all the different topics in the different uh, uh, documents. And then like, are these documents similar to these other documents? Right? Yes or no? So that's sort of clustering at a text level. All right. All right, so we're going to talk about text analysis. It's a little bit complicated, and there's a lot of things to get wrong. So we're going to try and take a little bit more time in this section. Unlike almost everything you've done in this class, text is not a data frame. It's not a CSV. It's this unstructured document with a bunch of words using grammar and punctuation and things that you, we haven't talked about yet. So it's a little more complicated. <laughs> if you thought JSON and XML and HTML were hard, English is way harder. Seriously. People get their PhDs in it. I don't think I make it to PhD in XML. That's just, I'm just saying. All right. <laughs> so you'd think, well, I just mentioned we have grammar and spelling, right? So like it's all good. But if if you've ever used English, it's a little complicated, right? So everything has an exception in English in most languages. Spellings vary by locale, right? Where you are matters. Um, spelling can be incorrect. People aren't infallible, right? They make spelling mistakes. As a piece person parsing all these documents, you're going to have to deal with the people who generated that data. So that's the the problem. And so there's a whole field of study related to just that topic. Right? Natural language processing, it's a big field. So just to like, well, I think everything's pretty straightforward, right? Like, I'm going to try and show you that that's not correct. Okay, so I've got a sentence, it ends with a period. So obviously, if I can take uh, text and I figure out where the periods are, then I can identify where the sentences are. That's a really straightforward mm -hmm. point, right? That's also very wrong. Okay, so here's an easy example, which is like, obviously, this is a set of sentences. They're separated by these little dots. And so if I parse that out in Python, I'm good to go. Right? So far, so good. And how many sentences are there? Like, so we've got one, two, three, right? Easy. OK, this is also going to show up in the same document, right? just to like get you. And so here, there are uh, two sentences. Right? But if we separate it by periods, that's clearly not going to work. Right? I have to hit you with just about every exception I can think of in the easy sentence. We've got abbreviations. We've got uh, the abbreviations there. We've got titles. Right? If you split on periods, you will fail. So what do we do? Yeah. All right. So the, the what do we do part, like again, going back to this is a long journey with like lots of tools and its own little special subdomain. And so we're not going to cover everything here. We're going to try and get through, what, an hour and 10 minutes worth of content, right? <laughs> so I apologize if we didn't touch on everything. I'm going to touch on what I think are the major points. So we're just going to focus on text. But you can think of this also as showing up in audio and images. Right? So imagine your Google Street View. Does anyone here not use Google Street View? Everybody's good. That's the part where like you're in Google Maps and you can see the Street View, the name. <laughs> you got me, Alex. All right, so, so in the Google Street View, they have um, signs, right, like like street names, and they have all these little like house addresses. So they've used uh, visual uh, process, uh, image processing to identify the street signs and the addresses on buildings in Street View. Right? So that's a lot of image processing. But in the end, they're trying to grab all the text. They can assign where the locations are based on street signs and addresses. And obviously, audio has a bunch of natural language stuff, but that's even more complicated. So, all right. So the first challenge is basically to find the text. 
Another activity for you. Up a web browser. Right? Find the word loan. I will join you in a moment. Let's see if we can find one. All right, so hopefully everyone has uh, familiarity with the idea of control F, and that takes you to this little find bar. Almost every other like application has a find tool. Acrobat Reader, Microsoft Reader, they all have find, right? And so if I look for the word loan, does that show up? Awesome, all right. So this is super handy, right? We just found this string, and it was case insensitive. So like, that's what I, I'm pretty confident in guaranteeing that everyone is familiar with this approach. Right? The, the, the point of the exercise here is you're all familiar with this. And so you think, well, I wanted to get text. I can find text. I'm done, right? Like, pretty straightforward stuff. And, and most people um, have that familiarity. But the questions that we as data scientists want to ask are typically a little harder. So I want to find all the email addresses in the text document. I want to find all the phone numbers in the text document, right? And so the naive approach, if you only knew about control F, right, you just have to type in every phone number, find it, and then like, no, it didn't find it. Try the next phone number, right? So I'm going to give you the tool that solves that problem. Right? How do I find all the phone numbers in text? All right, so the trick here is there are some patterns. So the email address has this sort of format. Phone numbers have that sort of format. So really what we want to do is we want to describe that format in a very generic sense. Right? We've got some letters, maybe some numbers, a symbol, some more letters, a period, right? and then some letters. So like that's sort of the generic description. Same thing down here. We've got numbers, dashes, numbers. So we want a symbolic language to deal with that generic pattern. Regular expressions. Whoop, whoop. Who here has heard of or used regular expressions? Oh, I have to pass out here. Right? Okay, so that's good. Right in the middle. That's good. Yeah, so before I get too far, basically the idea that I want you to walk away with from this little discussion that we're going to have about regular expressions is that you can symbolically represent a set of symbols as, a, as some other symbol. And so rather than specifying 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, I can just say it's a digit and then be done with it. Right? That's super handy. There's, other, like, there's lots of ways to do the same thing in regular expressions. So you'll also see me say the characters 0 through 9 inclusive. That's another expression for a digit. But they're equivalent, and they don't have to say all the values um, explicitly. Mm -hmm. right, so now we're going to do some magic with regular expressions. Handy dandy library called RE. You will use it at some point in your life. Then I have this text file. I loaded it. Right, I'm even using that load statement. All right, so let's, oh, sorry, in this text document, I just have some standard text, an email address, a phone number, right? Stuff going on there. So you're just like, oh, Ben's setting us up for a little demo. All right. So I want all the instances of 953, which hopefully should show up there. Right? So here's regular expression find all 953. This doesn't actually exercise to me, like the actual use of regular expressions, because it's just doing a, a plain string matching. So nothing different than you've previously done. No magic there, right? Now let's do the magic part. So I'm going to use that same library and say, find the patterns where I'm matching this sort of representation. Right? Three digits, a dash, three more digits, and then four more digits in that text. This is the fun part, right? We just solved that problem that I was talking about. What a coincidence. All right, that was a joke. Yes? Yes, absolutely. So let's 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 put in uh, maybe a slash then. Hmm. 
Mm, there we go. So all instances of the match. Okay, so so that's not the end of the demo. There's just a bunch of space there. All right. So we can be more concise. And this is just for like laziness purposes, but basically you can take that digit and say I want three of those, another digit, three of those, and so there, again, there's lots of different ways to slice the same problem in your regular expressions. They'll get you the same answer. All right, remember back in that text file, we had an email address here at person at farm.com. There's probably another one over here, my name. All right, so let's look for those. So here what we're going to do is we know the fact that email addresses have an at symbol followed by some letters, typically we think. And so we're going to find everything where we have an at and something through A through Z. One of those characters. All right. So what it returns is the literal match. So because we're only looking for that pattern, then we only find that. That's not actually what we sort of intended. We want the thing with any number of characters, right? So this plus sign is saying, like, I want all of the A through Zs or any number of them that follow an at symbol. Getting a little closer to what we want, but still not quite there. And so we're going to go. Um, we'll, we also want the username right at the front of the email address. So we're going to have an arbitrary number of characters repeating the at symbol, followed by an arbitrary number of characters. So we're, we're sort of building our, our our case here to get more email addresses. Still missing the domain, right? So now we have to add in. We've got some characters. An at symbol, more alphabetic, uh, alphabetic characters, and then a period, because we skip by a slash, and more characters. All right, let's see what that returns. But at this point, we've got the email addresses we wanted, but this is getting a little difficult, right? This is a lot of stuff. I'm just, I'm just introducing to it, you to it, so if it's new to you, it's a little messy. Luckily, you can document these things. Explain what your intent is. This is super useful because, like, in a week or two, after having written a regular expression, you'll forget what the intention was. And so, the ability to sort of document within the regular expression, this is what I'm trying to capture. I highly recommend that. Okay. So, and this is my little warning that don't try and use this pattern to match all email addresses because obviously email addresses are way more complicated than that. Question. Okay. It is. Uh, so it won't match if there's an uppercase. Yeah, and so um, actually, I'm going to take you to this little website here. This is super handy because I know I want to search for email addresses. How hard could that be, right? This is a solve. This is where we're talking about that first slide where has anyone else ever solved this? The answer is absolutely yes. So don't try and invent your own solution. You'll probably get it wrong. All right, I'm going to go to the regular expression library, which is online. I'm going to search for the word email. This is a bold website looking thing, but um, never mind that. All right, so look at keyword. I'm going to look for email. I'm going to think, find uh, regular expressions that have that in their title. So I'm going to search. And it says it found 545 regular expressions with email in the title. That tells you there's a lot of different people with different assumptions about what email looks like. So now the hard part becomes, well, which one of those is correct? That, you know, there isn't a well-defined answer for that one. So I think they're ranked. This is a, yeah, yeah, exactly. They're, they're rating. And so like, they try and tell you like which ones it will, will and won't match. But you can see like this one is overly simple, right? They titled it. So <laughs> that's sort of handy. Yeah. OK. So and this isn't the only regular expression. Expressions are very popular. Um, and so lots of people try their hand at them and might not get them right. Oh, yeah, it's also the other trick here is that you can also get things that don't match the pattern you're looking, right, if you're poorly constructing a real expression. So there's a danger there of getting back more than what you wanted if you construct it incorrectly. Mm, yeah, going back to the notebook. All right, so. They're not just for searching. You can do replacement. 
right? So let's say that I wanted to black out the last four digits of a phone number. All right, that's pretty handy, right? So like if I wanted to anonymize the data, this is one trick that I can play, right? The danger here is that if I had, say, my street address was one, two, three, four, Lucky Lane, right? That's also gonna get blacked out. Maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's not, right? But this isn't an explicit sort of like, oh, this is a phone number, therefore I'm blocking it out. It's just finding all the matches for four numbers. So hopefully your your like your paycheck isn't four numbers because that'll be blacked out too. All right. So yeah. So this is typically in Python the way that we'd split lines is uh, looking at a period followed by a space. That's typically a bad idea. Mm. The, the way that I think we're going to cover this uh, a little bit later, but there's a library called NLPK. Come back to that. What's that doing there? Oh, yeah. All right. So this is out of order. All right. Oh, all right. Sorry. This is in the wrong place. I led you down in the wrong path. All right. But all right. Then you can compile your other expressions. That's just another thing to think about. Let's see that one. Yeah, so we're going to cover a little bit more time on regular expressions. Uh, a few more slides. So regular expressions get used anywhere there's text. And so this is like a cool example I found of gene editing and like genome sequencing. Like you can uh, identify patterns in the genes using regular expressions. So a handy, handy use case. All right. And there's a bunch of updates. Right. Questions on regular expressions? Most time. All right, so <laughs> this is like a, a, a good refrain to keep in mind. So just because you're doing sec, uh, search on text does not mean you should use regular expressions. So a really common example of this is in parsing HTML. So I'm not a computer scientist, so I'm not going to claim to know what a regular language is. But there's categories of languages, and so regular expressions is not the most complex language. HTML is a more complicated, complex language. And so therefore, if you try and parse HTML using a regular expression, it uh, will fail. And so this is why we use beautiful soup. So beautiful soup does parse HTML. Um, and it's not as generic as regular expressions. It just handles one language. So the danger here is like trying to figure out if I'm searching through text, is it HTML? Is it a regular language? Is it just a simple string match? Right, so now you've got an array of choices to make about the, the searching you want to do. All right, everybody's falling asleep. So before the break, we're going to do one more exercise to get up and move. All right, you saw this coming, right? This is the divisive algorithm. All right, so we're going to split, or sorry, we're going to start by starting in one big group at the center. So we're all going to like cluster up puddle. <laughs> so this is so that previously we were doing a kilometer of clustering where we started to spread out and then we formed groups. Here we're starting as one big group and we're gonna split up. All right, as soon as everybody gets to the center room, then we'll we'll start the, the game here. All right, so that does anyone want to call out what the first sort of step in this algorithm is gonna be? Yes, uh, so I'm going to, even before that, I would say, like, we're going to have to figure out what the max and min is and, like, in order to figure out what the range is. So I, I think we had the minimum of three and maximum of eight, right? So that would be just a simple query back to the data, you guys. <laughs> Here's the data, right? Okay, so if we have a max of eight and a minimum of three, let's split on six, right? So people with six or more letters go to that side of the room. People with five or fewer letters go to the this side of the room. Right, so you guys, so right. So again, we're doing some parallelism here. I'm only one CPU, so I can only do one set of instructions to the data at a time. Right? You see how that's literal. Right, so we've got sixes and above, fives and below. So our partitioning wasn't quite even. The consequence of that is, if the data is not splitting evenly, there's going to be more work for me, the CPU, over on this side of the room. We sort of imbalance the parallelism. Make sense? So we've got us working. So this is six through eight. 
So let's split it here. Seven and above will go here, and six and below will there. Okay, so guys, our three to six. So let's split on four. So four and below on this side, and five to six over here. You guys are now seven to eight. Six. And you guys are sixes. So I'm done over here, but you're the smallest group. You're in front of them. What happened to you guys? <laughs> All right, so we split on four. That's great. Right. So you guys must be threes and fours, yes? Okay, so we basically, this was the algorithm. We got threes and fours, fives, sixes, seven, eight. So that's the algorithm, right? We didn't, we could have done it in parallel, but there's only one CPU, so. All right, thank you. You're on break until 840s. 848. So, Dan, do you want to take a break and have you just do that after class, or is it uh, time to quick bit? Like, uh, yeah, let's, let's try it quick. Yeah, it's like <laughs> well, that was interesting though because I typed in the data points. Yeah, that one I can't explain. <laughs> I want, okay, but I think here's the Mac description. You had uh, executed. So let's go back to kernel. We're restarting zero.
Okay, so we're going to resume on. Uh, so we've introduced text analysis. We've done finding patterns using regular expressions. And now we're going to clean up text. And this is where most of the dirty work is done. Right? So there's a lot of manual, hands-on labor involved with writing a bunch of Python to clean your data. All right. So uh, yeah, and then we'll cover, we'll come to a, a term term frequency inverse document frequency as our algorithm before getting to the homework. So this is like a, it turns out that when you're speaking, most of the words you're using are relevant right, to the person who is listening. But that's not the case for the computer. So this is like a distinction between you and the computer. So here's a bunch of really boring sentences. right? I don't recommend reading these. But the point is, in any body of text, there's going to be words that are in some sense, irrelevant. And so I'm going to highlight those for you. So you have words like is, right, and a, and of, and the, and and, right? These are words that they're, they're short, right? And the reason they're short is because they're common, right? And they don't actually add a lot of value to describe to the computer the concepts that are going on, right? So for the computer's use, I don't actually care about these short, frequent words that are generic. So in this case, I'm going to highlight uh, a couple of them just to say, like, they're, they're relatively common. And identifying them gets pretty straightforward after a while. All right. So these have a special uh, title in, in natural language processing called stop words. Stop words are the ones you don't care about, and you're going to get rid of. All right. So the the thing that I was sort of like pointing to is a lot of these words are short. Right? But length of the word is not a good indicator that it's a stop word. And so we can't be that lazy, right? If we just throw out all the short words, we'll throw out things like Ben. And no one wants to throw Ben out because that's my name. All right. So, so if you're just going off length, you'll probably get some of the stop words wrong because some of those do matter. So luckily, there's this library which lots of really smart people have worked on to save you all that work. So that means you don't have to do it, which is good. Mm, yeah, I can see. Yeah. So an NLTK, that's the Natural Language Toolkit. It's a package. You can install it, see if it works. Um, and so I think this is like by Stanford. Someone produces this. He didn't say. All right. So uh, it has a bunch of different things in it. and so. Once you've installed the package, then we can import the library. And then there's a couple add-ons. And the add-ons have to be downloaded. If you don't have those, it will warn you and tell that you have to go download them. So this is me knowing in advance that I have to download these packages, or the, the data sets, rather. So 
stop words is that collection of short words that are common and not particular to the thing that I care about. So I'm going to get those from NLTK. And then punk uh, is for processing uh, text um, into sentences, so punctuation. All right, that same sort of like text blob that I've used before, right, that's what I'm going to be looking at. So before I was saying that um, if we split on the period, that's sort of like a naive way of going about it. And in this uh, example, I think that mostly works. I don't think there's anything like doctor or abbreviation or like short, shortened words like that. So in this splitting on, on periods would work, but uh, NLTK has this um, module called tokenize. And so tokenize, you can tokenize words and sentences, right, and split those into little chunks. So that's what we're going to use against this text. Uh, that works. Okay. All right. So what an LTK is going to return to us is a list of the sentences. And then you can do the same thing for each sentence. You can break it into words. Again, there are things that normally you might have trouble catching, like the word Dr. Bob, right? It's actually a title, and so like you want to keep those together. So splitting on uh, spaces isn't necessarily a safe bet. Okay, so that's just a quick use of the tokenize library. All right, and then we're going to use the stop words list that we downloaded earlier. And so en stops is English stop words, and so it's like a static list. And so this is a list of all the stop words that this library has in it, which is not too long. I don't know, a couple hundred. All right, so the length of that is 139. Good guess. All right, so then what we're going to do is we're going to take all of these sentences, and we can take out the stop words right, using an LTP. All right, so these are the same sentences without the stop words. And you can see that the, the sentence is still somewhat understandable, but clearly really not spoken English. So the value here is now we've got the main keywords for each of these sentences. So we can start sort of like doing some, some algorithm against those. Right. Questions on that? Okay, pretty straightforward use of a library. Uh, that is a separate task. So yeah, you get rid of like the semicolons, the periods, commas, yeah. Yeah. OK. So um, stop words is, again, a really common problem that people have to solve. And often, the stop words are specific to the body of text they're looking at, the corpus. But the corpus of text may have different stop words. And so people typically start with a list of common stop words and then add their stop words for their corpus based on what the data that they're analyzing. Um, and so the point here is like, even though there's a bunch of different options, there's not a right option. It's just sort of like, does this list of stop words work for you? And there are algorithms to like figure out from the text if this word is super common and showing up everywhere, it's almost by definition a stop word. So if you just look at the statistics on all the words, you can figure out which ones are stop words if you have enough data. So it's not actually mandatory that you start with a static list. It's just a really common starting point. Has anyone here done use of stop words or like tokenizing that totally new? We got one. What'd you use it for? Ah. OK, good. All right. So as I mentioned, now that we've removed all the like the, the stop words, we'd want to actually look at the, the word specific documents. All right. So that's going to use an algorithm. And I think, yeah. All right. So yeah. So the idea here is that I figure out which words are specific to each document so I can figure out um, what that document is probably talking about that separates it from all other documents. So that's the, this algorithm. And basically, you can sort of like picture this giant matrix or data frame right, for us of having all the words that you'd see in all the documents. And that's what we're going to construct. 
So back in week three, there was a data set that I showed you, but I skipped over it pretty quickly. So turns out we're going to go back to that same uh, data set and review what the actions were there, because this will be relevant for the work you're going to do after class. All right. So if you don't remember, I'm going to refresh your memory. I have this directory called essays. It has a bunch of text files and a Word document in it. And so what I want to do is take that directory, get all of the text out of it. Right? And so I'm going to have to write separate tools to get some Word documents, get it separate from text documents. And so in the end, I want to get like this collection of text, but I first have to access all the documents. So there's this handy library called Python DOCX. Right? Guess what that's for? It's for opening up Word documents and getting the text out of them. Good stuff. All right. So I'm going to import that library, and then I'm going to take this a single document. And basically, I'm stepping through what I would recommend to, uh, to parse this single document. And in the end, once I get that tool set, then I'll go back and parse all the the words uh, from that from all the documents. So in the document, I've opened up with the uh, DOCX library. It automatically splits it into paragraphs. Like I need, right? I can take every paragraph and then index it and just print out what that. Right. And this should be pretty understandable from the perspective of we know what a Word document looks like, so it's pretty similar. Right. So that's just getting the text out of a Word document. And then what I want to do is do that for all the do for all the, the Word documents. So I'm going to take that same idea, this sort of snippet of code that I developed in the previous notebook, and I'll loop over every Word document in the directory. And then to say when I have uh, a new Word document file, that file name will be the key for dictionary. So basically, I'm setting up this is my dictionary with the name of the file and the content from the document. So this is me iteratively developing the functions I'm going to need to get all the text from all the documents. All right. All right. Now, PDFs, they're a little bit harder. So that won't be in your homework, but the PDFs are pretty common. So having a different set of tools to analyze PDFs is handy because the structure of the PDF depends on the way in which it was generated. So most often you'll see like Microsoft Word PDFs, right, or like PDFs that came from Acrobat Reader or Writer. Right? Like that. Uh, so it depends on the structure of the PDF, depends on what generated, and the library which you'd want to use to parse that PDF is specific to the content. So it's a little messy. All right, but basically, the same exact idea applies. I can use uh, some Python library to extract the content of each PDF. All right. uh, this just goes through and uses a different library called Tika. <coughs> right. So now I'm going to combine those different. Uh, oh, this is by text file. I have to do for PDF, DOCX, and then text files. Basically, I'm just building up my set of functions. Text files are super easy, right? If it ends with text, you can have all the text. So that's why I didn't bother with a separate notebook for that one. All right. So let's run through this. Next. I'm going to skip over that one. Now, the thing that I'm building is a dictionary with each file name and the content of the file. That's going to give me my sort of like starting point. I'm going to have to come back later for each document and clean up this value from the dictionary. Make sense? I'm just storing, I'm assuming every document is unique for a title and then using that as a key. All right, I think this should work. Mm, no. All right, skip over that guy. Same thing. So I just I dragged all my functions over here. I'm going to read all the documents and put them in dictionaries. That's too long, so I'm going to skip over that. that finish, yeah. all right, so now, in the end, here I only have text files in DOCX as a PDF. And so this is giving me a list of keys. That's all the files that I've now ingested into my dictionaries. And we can look at one of those 
as content, right? To see what the <coughs> content of that dictionary is. And lastly, so this is again, going back to my methodology, when I have a workflow of notebooks and they're sequential, I typically want to save my progress um, in terms of the data. So that that dictionary that I just showed has all the document names and all of the document content. I'm going to save using pickle to a file. So then I can go off and use another notebook that loads that data set in as a starting point. So it's a way of partitioning my workflow steps. All right, so there, this is my goal here in showing you all of that is just to say, you can grab text from documents and now we have to clean it up. All right, so again, I'm starting exactly where I said I would start, which is with the pickle. And then I'm saying, now that I've got that dictionary, it's the same thing that I was looking at. Okay, there's a bunch of steps here. If you have questions at any point, like what is that code snippet doing? It's a totally reasonable question. So I'm just going to take and grab a list of all the words separated by spaces. Right. And so my list here it happens to grab the first uh, characters from the first document. So not very exciting. It's just the, the title of the document. I can shift all of those to be lowercase in place. And now I can see lowercase. Right. And in the corpus, the set of documents I was looking at, I can count how many total words there are and how many unique words. And just sort of like normal statistics, right? This should sort of feel familiar when you work with data frames. And you want to get a sense of the data that you're looking at. In data frames, you'd use like a shape command. Here we're just looking at the word list. All right. So just looking at more counts. It's not very exciting. All right. So I want to figure out what the most common word is. I can sort by the, the indexer and then the not not shocking, right? But I can also get a list of the most other words sorted out of that uh, seven thousand. I think it was. So, in a set of essays about data science, it shouldn't be surprising that the and data science both. All those three of those show, right? It's like confirmation that we're looking at a good thing. The least common ones, not good thing. All right, now we're going to install an LTK. And we're going to move all the stop words from that giant list of unique words that we have. All right, so we've now taken the the original set of words and reduced it down to just the ones without stop words. Removed, I think, 179 of them. So now we're down to 1,300. And this is starting to sound more reasonable, right? From a topic modeling perspective, it's not surprising. We have data, science, Python, statistics, list methods, like all those are starting to make sense. So this list is much more useful from a topic modeling perspective. All right. I think. Thank you for that one. All right. All right. So, remember where this one goes. All right. So, this is my last step before running the term frequency in your document frequency. Um, now that I've cleaned up the word list for all the words, I have to do one more step. And when I feed the term frequency in your document frequency algorithm, I have to give it the list of words from that document. But it doesn't want all the words in their natural order just wants a list of unique words that are not stop words. So this means for every document, I need to create a list of words that show up in that document right, just once with no stop words. So that's what this notebook does. I'm using um, Mounty uh, Corpus to filter the stop words. I'm going to take the lazy route of not tokenizing it well. And then this function is just going through all the list of words for each document, removing the punctuation, all the things we did in the previous uh, notebook. So here, we're doing it sort of step by step in different cells. And this is just doing it one big blast. In the end, what it's going to write out is for every file, uh, a file associated with the same file name with a different extension. And that 
that list will just be all the words in the in the essay. All right, let's run this, and I'll show you what that looks like. All right. All right. So I had the original file is here, like week one history of data science DOCX, and then there's another file associated with that week one data science DOCX dot So let's take a look at what the contents of that are. Week underscore one. Right, so this is that I quoted about was spitting out all the words that show up in the essay as a list. So this is going to be my input to the term frequency inverse document frequency. So my recommendation is when you're going through this type of thing, look for mistakes like this one. So this is clearly not a word. The good thing is it won't show up too often, but there's some mistakes that I would need to go back in my cleaning process to figure out where was that triggered, right? So somewhere, it looks like I probably removed a space for the three ambitiously, and those two became a word. So that's going to throw off my analysis of like how often the word mathematical shows up and how often the word statistical shows up. Um, see if there's any other mistakes. Yeah. So this is sort of like a, a reasonably successful example of what the input to the term frequency versus document frequency should look like. Okay, so if we go back, if you remember this picture, right there. <coughs> so we're basically constructing the input. Um, in this structure, where we have a list of all the words and a list of all the documents. That's where we're aiming. Mm -hmm. And the last sort of like win here. I'd be pretty excited if this works. So. All right, the term frequency inverse document frequency is really simple. It just says, I'm, here, I'm not going to read the documentation, but um, if you're trying to figure out which words show up in which documents less frequently than other documents. Right? So if this word only shows up in this document once, it's more representative that's unique to this document. That's really what we're looking for. The words that are very common across all documents, those are less descriptive of, of the content. That's what we're trying to count. So again, we've got our data prepped in that directory. So I'm going to point to it. We'll construct that matrix and then run it through those functions. <coughs> this is just a test of like, it did actually find the data that I was looking for. It's good. This is a really small data set. This is something like 20 essays. And each essay has roughly 100-ish words. This is typically too small for, for the TF-IDF algorithm. And you'll see that in a moment, why that shows up. 25. Mm, yeah. All right, so then we'll run the algorithm, and, and here's what we get back from CFID. So we've got the file name, and then the ranking of the word. And you'll see most of these values, the scoring of how important that word is to that document, they're all pretty much the same. Um, that's because this data set is really small, so it has a hard time differentiating the different documents. But if we scroll down here to the next file, so I'm, I'm printing out the top 40 words, by the way. So here we can see the the ranking on the second file is slightly different. Um, and then these values pixel um, in decreasing order. So towards the bottom of the list, we should see slightly smaller values. But yeah, they're not super significant. Mm, I think they're percentages. Yeah, they're, they're the weights, basically, across the entire corpus, which words are specific to that document in ranked order. Yeah, I believe that's true. All right, I'm I want to find an example where the data actually changes a little bit here. 
Should be relatively cheap. Okay. Anyways, so this is the data set's a little bit too small to do TF-IDF, but mm, I thought I. Mm, yeah, I know they're not just there. Mm -hmm. for that one. The fun of live demo here. Mm. All right. We'll eventually give up. All right. We, so the fun part is like these are randomly ordered, and so like the when I ran this test, there was a couple documents that were like a little bit different, but these are all showing up. Same thing. Okay. Well, I'm gonna stop pressuring you with this, but I swear. Um, no. All right. Anyways. <laughs> no. Huh? This one. Up, 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 up. Twelve, thirteen. Yes. Woohoo! All right. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. All right. So this one, <laughs> slightly ranked higher. Twelve. All right. So not a huge spread on that, but again, these were twenty essays with a hundred words each. So. In some human sense, you could totally read that many essays, right? That's what I do for grading. So, <laughs> all right. So the goal here is to basically point out that in this specific document, there were words that were more specific to this one, like press, which not surprising, right? It's like more unique to this document because it's in itself. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Success. Thank you for misspelling somebody. I think that's yeah, okay. Good. All right. So as I mentioned, um, usually when we're starting with text analysis, you're given raw documents. And so you have to go through and extract the text out of that. There's lots and lots of um, uh, examples for us. So this is like a, a multiple of corpus. But the, the idea here is like lots of different samples for you to comb through. I'm going to give you your own data set. All right, so it's basically uh, a challenge for you of like doing basically what I just demoed quickly. Uh, uh, with a slightly different file output. So I'm going to give you a bunch of text files and documents, and you're going to um, return back to me a list of the words per document. No, <laughs> they're just normal. I don't think they're that hard. <coughs> All right, questions on that? So this means you'll be applying the sort of stop word removal, punctuation removal, sort of thing. All right. So this is that uh, when I was foreshadowing, this is what I was foreshadowing with the idea that um, I want to get a measure of how quickly you're moving through the homepage. So I'm going to give you an assignment. And I'm going to ask you for an email, and the email is in one of two states. One is like after an hour, right, of grinding through the homepage. This is like me relying on you to faithfully measure. How much time you're investing, whether that's reasonable, I don't know. But um, if you send me an email and then say like, I, I have completed the homework, right? It took 20 minutes. It's super easy. Like, that's good news for me. Or it's been an hour and I've got, you know, almost no progress. Right? So that's my measurement of from you of how you're proceeding on the homework. I, from this sense, I don't actually care what the value of this email is in terms of, like which of these two states you're in. My goal is to get a sense across the entire class of how is everyone attacking this. Does it make sense? Because I don't have like at the end of the homework, I don't say like this with homework took 25 hours or something like that, right? Like this is just my one-time measurement, so it's super low cost. I think it'd be a little too burdensome if I ask you what was the total time invested on this homework. Is that valid? Would that be too hard? Because that's that's really really my goal, right? Like I'm doing this is like a cross-sectional sort of one-time measurement. The other measurement would be like to say, how long did this homework take you? If you were watching TV, you might get a like, you know, really long answer, but it, you know, it took 30 minutes of effort over three hours. So, <laughs> not necessarily, but it'd be, uh, yeah. No, this is not graded. So, if you don't participate in the survey, I can't really hold you accountable for that one. All right. Then there's a reading assignment. Um, so. I can't give you all the knowledge of regular expressions. Like I've been using them literally for years, and I'll consider myself a novice. 
So like I can construct a Riley expression pretty easily. It's usually wrong, right? And if they're really complicated, it'll take a while to construct them. That's, hmm? <laughs> well, and going back to the documentation, like definitely if you doc if you don't document it, they can get like really long and hard to understand. And they get and they break, they're very fragile, right? Like if you make one character mistake in a regular expression, it just doesn't know what to do. And it won't tell you where the error is, right? Because it's one long line of code. So all right. So this is an essay. I'll be submitting it via Blackboard as plain text. So don't try and trip me up with a document. And I think that's it. So, 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 are we clear on this idea of like the text analysis and an email? That's like the new concept there. Question? Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, that's free to fill up, my bad. So you should definitely, there's a little piece of paper that you should have with your name tag. If you don't have your name tag, grab it. Um, but there's a piece of paper. If you want to just write on there what you learned, what you wanted to learn. I, I don't remember the exact statements, but they're on the piece of paper. So write on that with the answers to the three questions, and then turn that in with your name tag back up front. I want to answer the calendar question. Yeah, so I think like you're asking on your main, right? Yeah, I was looking at um let's see. MBC I know. Yeah. 